I did not actually know the song that Jen, Dennis just led now and didn't really explain to him what the lesson was about, but I think it was appropriate uh, in light of what this sermon is about tonight. Uh, I got a request recently to look at this particular passage in 1 Peter chapter 2 and to more generally explore the idea of what it means for us to be a priesthood of believers. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, it says, "...in coming to Him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ." For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. For they stumbled because they were disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. What does that mean for us? To be a royal priesthood. Well, before we start asking what it means for us to be a royal priesthood, we, I think, need to ask a more general question of, what is a priest? Um, I did a little word search, and, you know, all the times that the words, uh, the Hebrew and the Greek words appear for priest in the Bible, and there's over 900 occurrences, and uh, we probably can't read all those verses tonight in this particular setting. Uh, there's, the Bible has a lot to say about priests. But I think there's some very general principles that we can understand from reading the Scripture. The first time in the Bible that a priest is ever mentioned is in Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14, the context of this is that Abram's nephew Lot has moved into the city of Sodom, a place which does not, well, that this move does not end well for him, let's just put it that way. Uh, several of the kings to which the Sodomites and the other people of the plain were paying tribute decide. Uh, they, the Sodomites decided to revolt against them. Keter Laomer leads a whole coalition against Sodom and Gomorrah. They capture the, the inhabitants of the city, and they defeat them in war, and they carry them off into captivity, which unfortunately includes Abram's poor nephew Lot. Abram gets word of this and decides, I'm going to do something about this. And he gathers 318 men of his household, and they go and they uh, fight against Keter Laomer and his people. And they capture them, and they rescue Lot, and they rescue all the other inhabitants of Sodom, and they take the spoils back with them. And as they're deciding how to divide them up, in verse 17 of Genesis 14, after his return from the defeat of Cheder Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of, the, of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. And after that, Melchizedek's not mentioned anywhere else in Genesis. And, you know, he just kind of vanished. He vanishes off the scene as quickly as he comes in. We're given no genealogy. We're given no information about who he is. Just that he was the king of Salem, probably an archaic name for Jerusalem, and that he was a priest of the Most High God. And in this one scene with Abram, he does one thing for Abram. He blesses him. What does that mean? Blessing somebody. You know, blessing is kind of one of those weird religious words that we just sort of, you know, people assign whatever meaning they want to. Well, in the context of the Bible, there's really two things, uh, two contexts to blessing. You could be talking about blessing God, and when you're, when you're talking about blessing God, really what you're just talking about is praise. Uh, you know, many of the Psalms have this line in them, Bless Yahweh, O my soul. Or, you know, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul begins his letter to the Ephesians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even Peter, in 1 Peter, begins his letter in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 by saying, Blessed be God. When they say that, all they're saying is that God is to be praised. So that's one meaning of the word blessed is just praise. But another meaning, some, 
Because quite frequently in the Bible you'll see God blessing people, and He's obviously not praising them as superior to Himself. What we're doing is He is calling favor on them. And whenever God blesses you, it means that favorable things are going to happen to you. It means that God has spoken well of you. Uh, it's probably no coincidence that the Greek word in the New, one of the Greek words in the New Testament for uh, blessing is the word we get our English word eulogy from. You, know, you think about eulogizing someone whenever you have a funeral. You speak well of them. You talk about all the good things. You remember about them. That's what a blessing is. It is to speak well of somebody. And whenever God speaks well of you, good things happen to you. Now, what if, suppose somebody else speaks on behalf of God and blesses you on behalf of God as a sort of mediator or intermediary. That person is the priest. Or the, in some cases, the prophet will sometimes do that as well. But the main job of the priest then is you have God up here and you have the people down here and in the middle you've got the priest. And the priest's job is to bless the people on behalf of God, to call God's favor on them. His job is also to present the people's sacrifices to God and we'll look at some texts that talk about that in a little bit. But effectively, that's what the priest is, is. He's the intermediary. He's the guy that goes in the middle. He is the middleman. Why is a middleman necessary? Well, because there's a curse in place. What's the opposite of blessing? The opposite of blessing is cursing. In Genesis chapter 3, you know the story in the Garden of Eden, the man eats the fruit on the tree that he is not supposed to eat of, and he sins. When he sins, God places a curse on man, on woman, on the serpent, and really on the ground itself. Cursed is the ground on your account. The whole world is cursed and not blessed. What are we to do about that? Well, because there is sin, there is a separation between God and His people. And there is a need for this intermediary. The people are struggling to get to God to praise Him and bless Him. And God cannot really bless a people that is so... In, wrapped and engorged in sin. So there's a need for this sort of guy in the middle to be the priest and to help them on their behalf. Now, Genesis 3, you know, when we talk about God placing a curse on the world, is very quickly followed by Genesis chapter 12. When we rewind all the way there to Genesis chapter 12, in verses 1 through 3, the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. I will call favor on you, in other words. And I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Right there. Is That's how God intends to... Bridge the gap between himself and the people, the rest of the world, we might say. God intends to use, and I'll put Abram up here. God intends to use Abram and his seed as the means to bless the people. There is a very real sense in which when God says this to Abraham in Genesis 12, what he is saying is, is I'm going to make your people a kingdom of priests. I'm going to make your people a source of blessing for all the nations of the earth. And it is through them they will be they, It is through you they will be blessed. It is through your seed, it is through your descendants that they will be blessed. Now, of course, you know the end of that story. We're talking about Jesus, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. We will get to that point. And the other text I think is important in talking about the intermediary role of the priest is in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. In Hebrews chapter 5, the author of Hebrews tells us what the job of a high priest was, or more specifically, what was required for somebody to be a priest. I know he says high priest in this text, but really these principles apply to any priest, we might say. And in Hebrews chapter 5, I really should be writing these texts as I go. We've talked about Genesis 14, 17 through 20. And we've talked about Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now we're going to talk about Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Keep these up here so we can keep track of them. In Hebrews chapter 5, and verses 1 through 4, 
He says, Every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself is also beset with weakness and because of it he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. As for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God even as Aaron was. Out of, from that text, I get three things that a priest was supposed to do. You could not be a priest unless these th three things were true. First, you had to offer sacrifices. Well, kind of, and we might say, well, duh, that's sort of in the job description, isn't it? You know, you can't be a priest unless you do the things that a priest does. Secondly, you must be able to sympathize. You must be able, in other words, you must be human. You know, you're God up here, uh, he's fine the way he is, but the people down here have a hard troubles, and they have temptations, and they have difficulties, and they have death, and they have all these different issues that they're having to deal with. They need somebody that can sympathize with their weaknesses in order to appeal to God on their behalf. And that is the very point that he's making in verse 2 when it says he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself is also beset with weakness. And because of it, he's obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. And thirdly, and this is important, he must be appointed by God. Nobody gets to be this guy unless God says so first. You might think, well, duh, of course God gets to pick who the intermediary is going to be. You know, but those three points, those three points are crucial to the Hebrew author's argument as to what the priest is supposed to become. Now, you may get other things out of this text, but those appear to be the three primary things he's talking about here. And he goes on to talk about how Jesus fits all of these descriptions. He offers sacrifices on behalf of the people, and namely the sacrifice he offers is himself. He sympathizes with the people. This is the point that was being made in Hebrews chapter 2, when it says that he tasted death for everyone. You know... Death doesn't take hold of the angels, but it does take hold of the descendants of Abraham. So if Jesus is going to be able to sympathize with the seed of Abraham, he has to become like them. He has to become one of them. He has to endure death itself. And in verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 2, it says that since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Um, so, I mean, that's, again, the idea here is him being the sympathizer. And thirdly, being appointed by God, that just kind of goes without saying, even though he says it. Uh, the idea here is that, you know, you don't get to be the priest unless God says so, and God declared Jesus to be the priest. Where did he do that? Well, in Psalm 110 in verse 4, speaking of the Messiah, he says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We could talk all day about what that means. Uh, but I'll give you the, the Cliff Notes version that in Psalm 110, verse 4, that the point he's making is that Jesus was a high priest in the same way that Melchizedek was a, high, was a priest. He, his appointment to the priesthood was based on the same thing that Melchizedek's appointment was based on. Not who he was descended from, not who his mommy and daddy were, not you know the tracing your genealogy all the way back to Aaron or Levi, what Jesus' high priesthood was based on was the power of an indestructible life, i.e. the fact that he rose from the dead. And the Hebrew author makes this complex point in Hebrews chapter 7 about how Melchizedek was without father or mother, without beginning of days or end of life. You know, it doesn't mean that he literally lived forever, but it does mean that because we have no record of these things, he is effectively a perpetual priest. You know, we ought to think of him in those terms. Okay, so... We've, we've, we've kind of laid the groundwork for what a priest is. There is, I think, another crucial passage that we need to look at to understand 1 Peter chapter 2. And that is found in Exodus chapter 19. And bring us to Exodus chapter 19 in verses... Um, in Exodus chapter 19, I should be putting these texts up here, like I said... And really, kind of the focus is on verses 4 through 6. What's being said here in Exodus 19 is, I think, crucial to understanding this. When God first brings Israel out of Egypt, He brings them to Mount Sinai, 
And when they get to Mount Sinai, He gives Moses a message for them. You yourself, verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. God says three things here. I brought you out of Egypt. This is what I've already done. Verse 4. Verse 5. You should obey me. That should go without saying. And verse 6. If you obey me, I will make you the following things. I will make you a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. I think we need to appreciate how interchangeable these ideas are. He also calls them his own possession, something that Peter does in, uh, I'll say, own possession as well. I apologize if my handwriting is becoming progressively more sloppy. They tried and they tried in grade school to fix me and it didn't work. So, um. But you know, they are God's possession, they are the holy nation, they are the royal priesthood. You see how those ideas are come together. You don't get one without getting all three. They are a package deal of sorts. And in fact, this is the very point that Peter's making in 1 Peter chapter 2. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. He says all three of those things in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Why? Let's ask ourselves another question. Okay, you know, we'll, we'll stick Israel up here. If Israel is going to be a kingdom of priests on behalf of God, who are they acting as the intermediary for? Well, it's the, really the same promise to Abraham when you think about it, isn't it? Genesis chapter 12, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's what he's saying about Israel there. You're going to be that means by which I bless all the nations. You're going to be the go-between between me and the rest of the world. You are going to be the means by which I bless all the nations, by which I call favor on the nations, and you're going to offer sacrifices on behalf of the nations as well. Well, what sacrifice does Israel offer? Well, you know, I mean, you go through your whole Old Testament and, you know, you kind of go, well, where does Israel ever offer sacrifices on behalf of the rest of the nations or on behalf of the Gentiles? Well, let's ask ourselves another question. How does Israel act as a priesthood to the rest of the nations? Well, I would suggest a few things. First of all, they're supposed to be an example of holiness. Isn't that inherent in being a holy nation? Secondly, they are supposed to proclaim God's truth. They're supposed to point the other nations to the true God. Baal is not God. Marduk is not God. Ra is not God. Yahweh is the true God. Thirdly, I would suggest that one thing they would do is, yes, they would intercede on occasion for, the, for people in the world, outsiders, with prayer and sacrifice. And fourthly, and this is the most significant one, they act as the priesthood by bringing the Messiah into the world. I think we need to understand that idea. That the ultimate fulfillment of God blessing all the nations through Abram is by blessing them through His one seed, Jesus. Now in Galatians chapter 3, you know, he does not say seeds as to many, he says seed, referring to one, that is Christ, in Galatians 3 verse 16. But he goes on in that chapter to say that y'all are all Abraham's seed. In uh, Galatians chapter 3 in verse 20, I think it's verse 23, I don't know, it's the last verse of the chapter, I know that. Uh, what do we do with all that? The other nation, you know, let's look at some texts here though that talk about Israel's relationship with the nations and see how all of these ideas kind of come together. First of all, Deuteronomy 4, in verses 6 through 8. Keep them and do them, for that is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God whenever we call on Him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I'm setting before you today? What's the point he's making here? Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about this Deuteronomy... 4, 6 through 8. The idea being brought out here is that 
if you actually keep the law, if you actually do what I say, all the nations are going to look at you and they're going to think, wow, what an awesome God, what an awesome law that He has given them, what great statutes He has given before them. God is surely with this people. Another passage that we might look at is in Deuteronomy 28 in verses 9 and 10. In Deuteronomy 28 in verses 9 and 10, it says that the Lord will establish you as a holy people to Himself. There's that idea again. As He swore to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in His ways, so all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord. And they will be afraid of you. Here's an idea where Israel... Is they act as an example before the nations. They keep all the laws of God. And one of the blessings that God gives them is that all the nations will see and be afraid. Deuteronomy 28 in verses 9 and 10. Okay. Or you might think of Rahab in Joshua chapter 2. What does she say? In Joshua chapter 2... In verse 10, we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. What you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Why did Rahab defect to Israel? She defected to Israel because she heard of all the things that God had done for Israel. She saw all the things that the nation of Israel had been able to accomplish because God was with them. She said, that's the true God. And she actually converts from the Canaanite religion of her forefathers to the true God of all the earth, Yahweh. So we might say that this is a clear instance where Israel collectively has acted as an intermediary with one of the Gentiles, has acted in a way to bless someone who was not part of their group. And we could point to the Gibeonites in Joshua 9 and verse 9 as well. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read all the texts that I have on this. Uh, we could also probably point to 1 Kings chapter 8 and verses 41 through 43. Here's an interesting thought. Who was the temple for? The temple was for Israel, right? Could foreigners benefit from the temple? Yes, they could. In 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 41, concerning the foreigner who is not of your people Israel, when he comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays toward this house, here in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name, to fear you as do your people Israel, that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. And th this is Solomon's prayer of benediction for the temple, by the way. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verses 41 through 43. Now what do we do with that? You know, this, what he's saying here is that God knows no partiality. If somebody is out there who is not descended from Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, if somebody is out there who is not an Israelite, decides that they want to serve the true God and they want to pray towards Him and His house, then God, hear that prayer. That's Solomon interceding on behalf of the peoples right there. That's Solomon acting in, sort of, on behalf of the nation collectively, acting in this capacity as a kingdom of priests. Well, you know, all these things beg the question... And this is a discussion I may have had with some of you. Um, you know, there's this idea here that God, you know, when in Exodus 19, we rewind all the way back to that text we just read, that God said, okay, you know, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. And then a little while later, nope, Israel, you messed up. I'm taking it away. I'm giving it to just the tribe of Levi instead. The problem is no text says that. And, you know, I mean, I thought that for years, actually. And then it just sort of hit me one day that... You know, I kept read, I was reading in Exodus chapter 19, and oh brother, I lost the verse reference. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 22, before anything else happens, before God even appears on Mount Sinai and talks to the people, what does he say? You know, he talks to the people, he says, warn the people not to break through to the Lord to gaze and let them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Priests? Where did the priests come from? I thought 
whole nation was supposed to be a priesthood. Keep reading. Verse 24, The Lord said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. Priests? What priests? I thought the whole nation was supposed to be a priesthood. Nothing has happened yet. Nothing has happened that would signal that God would take that away. And this is where it gets kind of difficult for me to take this whole idea in. When would God have taken this away from them? When they got scared whenever he spoke to them on Mount Sinai? I mean, which is something that the Bible never condemns them for, by the way. The Bible, only, in Deuteronomy 5, you know, God speaks Israel the Ten Commandments. They react with fear. What does God say? He says, oh, that they always had that kind of heart in them. Oh, that they would always fear me in this way. The problem wasn't that Israel was afraid. The problem was they didn't keep their fear. They didn't respect God as the holy God he was. It's when God went away that things started to get bad. And they started to, oh, well, let's build a golden calf. What about the golden calf? Now, there are indicators in the Bible that God chose Levi on the occasion of the golden calf incident to be the helpers in the tabernacle. That is true. Deuteronomy 10, verses 8 and 9 hints at that. Uh, Exodus 32 indicates that they are the only ones who stood for the Lord on that occasion. But who do the Levites replace? Well, you read the book of Numbers. You read Numbers chapter 3, Numbers chapter 8. You see that the tribe of Levi is not replacing the whole nation. They're replacing the firstborn ones of the nation in order to act as helpers in the tabernacle. I would also note that, was everyone in the tribe of Levi a priest? No. In fact, Aaron and his sons are designated as priests in Exodus chapter 28 before the golden calf incident even happens. So what are we to do with that? And what are we to do with the fact that, you know, the tribe of Levi in Numbers chapter 18 and verse 3 is given restrictions on how they can access God, how close they can draw near to God. The priests, they're allowed to draw near to God. They're allowed to enter the holy place with certain restrictions. And the most holy place on... The high priest is allowed to enter the most holy place once a year. But verse 3 says that the Levites, they shall attend to your obligations and the obligation of all the tent, but they shall not come near to the furnishings of the sanctuary and the altar, or both they and you will die. And, you know... We could go on and on with this particular idea. But I think that if we start, if we start thinking of Exodus 19 in terms of, uh, okay guys, you get to be priests. Okay, now you don't get to be priests. I think we're missing the point of the text. What the text is doing, and he doesn't say, you're priests now. He says, you will be to me a kingdom of priests if you do these things. God doesn't see Israel's priesthood as a present reality. He sees it as a potential future for them in the same way that all the nations being blessed through Abram is a potential future. And not just a potential future, but a certain one. A certain one because God has a bigger plan in mind. And God's bigger plan was not the Levitical priesthood. It was not the Aaronic priesthood. God's bigger plan was always to bring Christ and to bless all the nations through Him. So what can we say about all that? I guess there's a sense in which, you know, since you've got all these temporary, small ways in which Israel acts as an intermediary between the nations, there's a sense in which, yes, from that day onward, they were a kingdom of priests. But they didn't do a very good job, did they? They weren't a great example to the nations around them, were they? What happened? The people began to blaspheme. Things began to go wrong. And then... When Deuteronomy talked about in the curses, well, in the blessings about how the nations would see and their behavior, well, Deuteronomy goes on in the curses section to talk about how the nation would see and fear and realize that, you know, God really wasn't on their side because they had just completely messed the whole thing up. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as much as said in Ezekiel chapter 35. So what do we say to all that? There's really kind of, really I guess you kind of got two separate simultaneous priesthoods going on in Israel all at once. On the one hand, I'm going to erase some of these texts to make room for myself on this board. On the one hand, what you've got here is God uses Israel as the intermediary for the world. But there's a problem with this priest right here. This priest is stubborn, weak, futile, unable to do God's work. They themselves are accursed. 
So what does God have to do? Well, God has to use, uh, set up another priesthood to bridge the gap between himself and Israel. But we got another problem here. This tribe of Levi, this high priesthood of Aaron, are they great guys? Are they doing it right? Oh, no, they're not. No. Aaron is beset with his own. I mean, Aaron was like the, master, was like the mastermind behind the golden calf story, wasn't he? Um, okay, so what are we going to do? I mean, humans aren't going to solve this problem. You know, if Aaron is beset with weakness and Israel is beset with weakness, how can God accomplish his goal of blessing the world through the seed of Abraham? Well, good news is that these question marks are totally unnecessary. If you've been in my Bible class, you know the answer to every question is Jesus. <laughs> That's the basic solution to all of this right here. This is how Jesus fits into the picture. You know, and this is the point I think we need to understand, is that we as a kingdom of priests now, we are not replacing the Levitical priesthood. Jesus replaces the Levitical priesthood. Jesus replaces that whole system. And I'll just mention a couple of things. Aaron had to offer sacrifices for his own sins. Christ didn't need to do that. Aaron had to repeat sacrifices annually. Christ was once for all. Aaron had to enter an earthly sanctuary made with hands, corrupted by human filth. Christ entered the heavenly sanctuary with his own blood. Aaron brought the blood of animals, bulls and goats. Christ brought his own blood. Aaron constantly reminds us of sin. Christ secures permanent forgiveness. Aaron had fear of entering through the veil into the most holy place all by himself. Terrifying experience. But what does Christ do? He gives us confidence to enter through the veil that is his flesh. In Hebrews 10, 19. To use the language of the Hebrew author, time would fail me if I read all of the passages in Hebrews that talk about this. Um, you know, but read Hebrews 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and you'll see how every one of these parallels just sort of comes to the forefront of what the scripture says on the matter. Hebrews 7 through 10. Just read that. And so we need to understand then that Jesus is subsuming the role of the priesthood. Now there's a sense in which the Levitical priests act as a type of our position. Isaiah 66, 21 envisions a time, for instance, where Gentiles would become priests according to the orders of Aaron and Levi. But, you know, we're not, we're not functioning as an intermediary for more of God's people here. There isn't, and sometimes people take this too far and they'll say, well, you know, preachers are priests, or elders are priests, or deacons are priests, or whatever. You know, they'll create these extra offices in the church to kind of say, well, you know, you as Christians still need intermediaries between you and God because you're just, you know, too weak in that respect. No. There's no, first of all, there's no pattern in the New Testament for that. Second of all, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, because of Christ, who has... Who has the confidence to enter the holy place? Brethren, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest, just one priest, not many, over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good works, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's an amazing story. It shows how Christ is the culmination and the fulfillment of everything that God has been working up to in human history. So where does that leave us? That brings us back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. He describes how we're like living stones. Living stones, that's an oxymoron. But we're not just any kind of living stones. We're modeled after the living stone. We are coming to Him, Christ, as the living stone, the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, the very cornerstone that was rejected by men. Why are all us living stones being gathered to the living stone? To imitate Him. Because we're trying to build something. We're trying to build a temple. But I thought the temple was gone. There is no Levitical temple now. 
that was subsumed and fulfilled in Christ, who sacrificed the temple of his body, was it not? And furthermore, in this temple, it's a, this temple where off we're there's a holy priesthood. I thought we got rid of the priesthood. I thought the Levitical system was gone. And furthermore, in this temple, we're offering sacrifices. Sacrifices? I thought we didn't need sacrifices anymore. I thought we didn't need the blood of bulls and goats. I thought we didn't need any of these things. All these different elements, the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices, all fulfilled in Christ. But who is our example now? Who should we be imitating now? Well, Christ. And if we take seriously the charge to imitate Christ... If we take seriously the charge that Peter makes in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, that you shall be holy, for I am holy, then we will be that kingdom of priests, that holy nation, that people for God's own possession. We will be like Jesus, imitating Him in all things, sacrificing because He sacrificed, building because He built, living because He lived. And what Peter is doing here is he's tying up those loose ends from the Old Testament. That final explanation of what God meant in Exodus 19 when he said, You shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Ultimately realized, not through some grand event in Israel's history, but some grand event in the true spiritual Israel of God. Us. His people. And God knows no partiality. Israel is not just Jews. It's Jews and Gentiles. God knows no partiality. God does not care about your race or your color or your gender or any of those other things. Those are all totally not having anything to do with our relationship with God. What has to do with our relationship with God is whether we are willing to submit to Him, whether we are willing to love Him, whether we are willing to sacrifice for Him and proclaim His excellencies. And how do we act as a priesthood in today's world? Well, I guess it's back to what we were singing about at the beginning about finding the lost. It's no coincidence that, you know, I stopped reading at verse 10 in 1 Peter 2, but keep reading. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. There's that same idea again. That same point that's made. The world is watching. And if you're doing the right thing, they will glorify God as a result of that in the day of visitation. But if not, well, the name of God is blasphemed among the outsiders, among the pagans, among the Gentiles because of you. The question you have to ask is, how good a job are you doing proclaiming His excellencies? That's what it says in verse 9. You became the chosen race, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. I'm going to take out your psalm books. We'll conclude the lesson here. Okay. I just... You know, as far as the practical point goes, I think this is one of the more powerful arguments that we need to be evangelizing to the lost. Some people will say, well, you know, we need to be really be kind of evangelizing by our example. I agree. We should evangelize by our example. But if that is the limit of what you do, oh, I'm just going to go around being a generically good person and hope that people figure out that I'm a Christian and magically decide to participate in this faith. Well, I mean, yeah, you should be living consistently with your faith. That's a... No-brainer! Of course you should! Of course I should! We all should. But that's not the limit of it all. We've got to tell people why at some point. We can't live our lives in this, you know, this fantasy world that people will magically guess that we're a Christian because we're nice to them. No. It's our role as priests in this world to proclaim His excellencies. I once heard an illustration or question that was being asked, you know, it was a sermon by the late Phil Roberts talked about how uh, there was this controversy over whether it was appropriate for people to say God bless you when someone sneezed. And he talked about this idea of being a priest and about this role of blessing all the peoples. And at the end he goes, you know, when you really think about it, Christians are the only ones who have the right to say that. Because they're the priesthood. That's their job, is to bless people. 
How are you blessing people? How are you acting as a source of blessing to others? Are you telling them about Jesus? Are you proclaiming His excellencies? Are you helping bring them to Christ? Are you calling down favor of God upon them so that they might see the way and they might see the truth? That's our goal as the people of God. And perhaps, perhaps you are here tonight and for whatever reason you're not a priest or you've forsaken your priesthood. You've forgotten to bless others. There's a lot of priests here who would be more than willing to help you, to bless you, make your life right with the Lord. That is why we're here. A congregation of priests, a congregation of saints and fellow holy ones who are trying to be holy before the holy God. If there's anything we can do to help make your right, life right with the Lord, let it be known. All together we stand and we sing. There's a fountain filled